Good Friday morning, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and thank you kindly for joining us on Real Talk with Keith Smith. It's a pleasure to connect with you through the I Love Seville Network, our studio in downtown Charlottesville on Market Street, right in the epicenter of everything we call Charlottesville, Almoral, and Central Virginia. We are in the heartbeat of our community, and this show is dynamic, where you, the viewer and listener, can help shape the discussion by asking questions, offering commentary, and giving your thoughts in the feed. Judah Wickhauer, the director and producer. My friend, if you could go to the studio camera and welcome a talented panel on a spring Friday <laughs> in Central Virginia. Usually, I woke up today. Usually says cast of characters. I was going to say. <laughs> usually that, says that. Yeah, I but I think because it. you're here, we're, we're being respectful. It's because Diantha is here. <laughs> I, had a, I had to up the language a little uh, bit here. We're being a little respectful. Uh, and, you know, today's yeah. National Woman's Day. Yeah, so, so, uh, con uh, so congratulations yeah, on that. I, and I appreciate that. So I think. <laughs> I think you're climbing. When I'm here with Neil, it's, yeah. It's <laughs> like, cast the characters. Uh, and one never knows who's going to show up in that. But thank you, guys. You know, t today, you know, we're going to just kind of kick off, maybe do a little bit of a uh, state of Albemarle County, right? We just had the State of the Union last night, so maybe um, you guys can chime in. For those who do not know each know who's there, we have Diantha McKeel with us, uh, Albemarle County Board of Supervisor, and Ned Galloway. Uh, out more board a supervisor partner in crime partner in crime <laughs> I, I can't get this uh, cast of characters out of my head but uh, interesting I couldn't think of a better group of folks to, to kick this off um, we've crossed the five year mark today is show number 600 Congratulations. 600 shows. Really? 600 shows today. 600 one hour episodes I've spent across from. You know, you have my sympathy, but you know. <laughs> and the best we could do was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we tried, but you know, we'll give it for that. So, Diantha, why don't you kick in from your perspective and say, you know, uh, how's Albemarle County doing? And uh, I know you guys had a couple of good board meetings here recently and just. Kind of do a little round table. Yeah, I think the talk a little bit state about of Albemarle County. County is strong. I think we are um, moving our um, community forward. Um, certainly, the budget that has the proposed budget from our um, county executive addresses many of those um, need, the needs that we have to move us forward. But we're strong. Um, economic development is strong. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because just one point that I think is fascinating, Cho, our airport, ser it serves a community of, you know, about 350,000 people, right? Um, Cho has approximately 20 commercial flights per day hmm. on general aviation side. We have seen recent activity of 60 flights um, per day on the private side. So if you look at commercial versus the private, we have a three to one ratio of private versus commercial activity. That speaks to, um, I think, engaged or, or, or economic development that people are coming in for tourism, they're coming in for business. Some of it's probably generated by the University of Virginia, but certainly uh, we have um, a, a high level of economic development that's happening in this community. Um, and I did, did uh, notice that um, uh, one of the statistics that was shared with me was that Cho is comparable to Jacksonville right now. Hmm. In volume. In, on the private side. Oh, really? Not the commercial, but the private, really? which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And they serve about 900,000. Com you know, community uh, members. I mean, you know, members of the community. We used to uh, fly up to New York out of Richmond, and we do this now out of Charlottesville. There's a couple of couple of three. I think it's three non-stops a day that mm -hmm. go out of Charlottesville directly into LaGuardia, uh, which is you know it's a quick 45 minute hour flight, something like that. Uh, it used to not be like that. It used to be you had to go to Richmond or yeah. whatever to yeah, fly out. Right. So, yeah. so that's really yeah. that's really interesting. Well, in our our TOT, you know, our tourism, our um, is uh, showing about a 17% increase this year, mm -hmm. which is, again, a healthy economy. And I'll stop with that and let Ned point out something that he wants to point out. Well, I, I think overall, I think you hit it, the nail on the head. I think we are, you know, we are in a very strong position in Albemarle. I think this year's budget is going to show some 
some discipline on the board's part. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We've had two years of phenomenal real estate growth, and this year was still over 4%. So we've, we've been bringing in a lot of revenue. We haven't done anything with the tax rate, but taxes have still gone up. And we have used that money to go after what we've said we're going to in our strategic plan. But we knew it wasn't going to stay at 8% and 13%. We even knew that last year. Yep. So last year's budget was actually a prep for this year's budget going, all right, if we would have just gone whole hog last year and put all these things in, we wouldn't be able to for afford to continue that. And you don't want to turn around and have to cut things. So I've been pleased that we have a county executive that um, – and a, the budget team and the finance office where we get the economic outlook report, with the right. folks from Virginia Tech that we right. work with. We look out five years. Uh, we do our financial planning based on what our strategic plan says we're going to do. And um, this year, well, there are many, Diantha had just printed out, she brought it. I haven't had a chance to review it yet, Whoa. but there are pages of items that we asked for a list of things that are not funded that you could consider initiatives or things that we are unable to do because the revenues that are coming in aren't able to get us there. So there's still a lot of things that we're not doing, and that's what I'm saying is the discipline. Yes. Like the board could, you know, in my opinion, you could, you could always raise the tax rate and bring in more revenue, but is that the right thing to do after you've seen the last couple of years of the, of the property values increase? And that's what city council is doing right now. Yep. Well, and I will say I have six pages here of items that um, were requested, not funded, or cut, actually cut from the budget in order to, for uh, uh, Jeff Richardson to, mm -hmm. to balance the budget mm -hmm. that he presented to us. Um, so I think this is helpful for, our, our, it's public information, it will be on our website. I think it's helpful for people to go mm -hmm. and realize that. That that's what we're not we're, going to this do. This is what we're not doing, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, we, so how it came, when we were talking in the budget, you know, the school board, when they put forward, um, that's going to be the challenge in our budget this year, but they have a $13.3 million gap. Now, the budget at the state level, I guess, I didn't even catch it until we, we, late. Yeah, it we changed learned that last night. Last yeah. night that yeah. it, they actually came to, came to some agreements or on the budget, so they're in the sales tax piece. So some of the $8 million gap from the state is going to close. close. I just don't know how much. Yeah. But, and we should talk a little bit about that for those who are watching or listening. It's always a struggle for the local governments to really try to get their budget squared away because <clears throat> you don't really know what the, exactly. what the state's mm -hmm. going to do. So mm -hmm. the fact that it sounds like they settled mm -hmm. on a budget, mm -hmm. I'm sure your folks at staff well, are going to be looking at that. And it's really difficult for the schools because they, re yeah. they rely on a lot more state funding yeah. than, than the local side. Um, so this year, there were two different things that they were watching. The composite, the local composite index crushed us. Yeah. Us and Nelson County got hit. Yeah. Um, you might want to explain that for those. So it's, it's how the, the state's formula to figure out how much um, money they're going to send you. And this, the, composite, the local composite index is basically what you can afford to pay As a based community. on your yeah. income and yeah. things, the different yeah. factors that they use. Mm -hmm. So we've, we do have a lot of... We have wealthy folks in Albemarle, mm -hmm. and when that climbs, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the state looks at it and goes, well, you can afford to do more on your own. Um, and this year, they adjusted every two years, and the hit this year was about $8 million bucks for Albemarle, uh, for Albemarle County Schools. Now, in addition to that, we also get the, I hate to bring this up. Yes, we do. But we get I the double hit because the revenue sharing sure. agreement we have with the city. <clears throat> you're paying twice. The money that yeah. goes to the city yeah. The state counts as still in our coffers right. for our ability to pay, right. which so we don't, we don't, we've, we've tried for years and we were on the school board to get the state to, to, to allow us to not have that, show that money in our coffers, but um, they weren't having that. And that's a two year lag again. Mm -hmm. And this year it w went up by $2 million. <clears throat> we're paying the city more, $2 million more. Which, which comes out of your side of the ledger board. Which is, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, yeah, right. <laughs> but in any so, case, eight million bucks. <laughs> now the sales tax. What's been going on between this, the House and the Senate and the, and the different budgets? This is the part where, like the composite index, we were hoping maybe they would give a forgiveness or something like that. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. But the sales tax agreement is going to do something for education because the Senate and that was what pushed that over. But that even if a, some of the eight million dollar gap gets closed, in addition to the eight million, the schools had another five million in needs that they right. they brought forward. That's how you get to the thirteen point three. So the schools 
no matter what the state does, are going to have a have a budget gap. Have, have a challenge, but the superintendent has said that he believes that he can work with his school board to cover that gap. We did, though, Jeff Richardson, in the budget he proposed, he did give the school board an additional 10, oh no, almost $11 million. And the reason for that was because they had school construction, new school construction in their, in the five-year CIP. And as we, many of us are experiencing, uh, construction costs escalated. Sure. So that was an attempt to try and help them cover that gap in their budget so that they wouldn't have to go back to the, the school, the design, construction design, and reduce the design of the schools. We were trying to make them whole, which I thought was appropriate. Right. We've made that mistake before yes. where we've cut back on projects. Greer Elementary and Diantha's yeah. District they cut back the capacity, and then it wasn't too long that you're already dealing with yeah, capacity issues. Yeah. So not good. And the uh, well, there have been multiple projects I could name in, the, in all of the districts that have been that way. So we were trying to make them whole. So we did at least address yeah. that challenge. So the list that, that Diantha has, like the schools, you're going to know. Like if they cut things, so they do a needs-based budget presentation. But the county executive brings us a recommended budget that's right. balanced, a, a, a rather a balanced budget. So you don't see the things that are necessarily that you maybe want to do, but you can't afford to do. So that's what this list is about. Mm -hmm. We should show folks, okay, these are the things that where we currently stand with the, keeping the tax rate the same, keeping the personal property tax rate where it that's is. That's what suffers. The, this is what, what we're unable to do. And if people think this is a wish list, we're talking about seven FTEs for the police. In a time when we're hearing about uh, speeding, uh, drop pedestrian safety, yeah. vehicle driver safety. I mean, so um, it, this is not necessarily just a, a, a wish Fluff. list of fluffy things. That's exactly right. This this is a really serious list. So at, at one point we're going to get to something that's near and dear to your heart, which transportation, is, which is transportation oh, <laughs> and rural <laughs> transportation, because that came up last night at the uh, Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission. But I do want to talk about two things. Um, one, I want to kind of give a little bit of a, of a kickoff and a shout out. I want to talk a little bit about solar and pickleball. Pickleball. <laughs> right? <laughs> pickleball was a big part of our discussion yesterday. It's booming. But um, yeah. so um, we're very fortunate. Tiger Solar, Jerry, I haven't shared this with you, are, are going to sign on as a, as a sponsor. Oh, and fantastic. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about solar. That's more of a residential level. But let's talk a little bit about on the large level. I know solar is something that is coming quite, quite often before you guys, and we talked about it yesterday a little bit. So you want to give folks a little bit of an update on what solar is looking like in Albemarle County? Well, we've... I know what it looks like on Route 53. Right. So Louisa <laughs> County was bringing up that, um, they, that they had too much too fast, and they had to, to pull, pull back and kind of contain it a little bit, and kind of check and see where they're at. Uh, Supervisor Barlow was sharing that information. I I, I, see, I missed that conversation. But yeah, we just good. had a siting agreement. So we had already yeah. approved the large solar P Woodridge down in uh, Scottsville. Scottsville. Scottsville District. And we had a, the siting agreement. So the, basically the siting agreement is your revenue piece. So what counties are allowed to do by the state, you kind of have to pick. You can, you can collect taxes of the machinery and tool tax on the equipment, or you can do it on the, uh, the, the megawatt generation. So the, the machinery and tool tax is kind of a revenue that declines over time, whereas the energy production is one that would grow okay. over time. So it's in a, a county has to pick one and then stick with it. You can't flip flop back and forth. So it's like, well, what what do you do and how do you you know? There's analysis that try to help you with that. We were fortunate in our agreement with um, Hexagon mm -hmm. that the siting agreement is going to between the company. This is a mutual negotiation that's going to allow Albemarle to take whatever's better the greater of yeah. the greater mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. and it's in supplemental payments so let's say the machinery and tool tax i mean it's going to be much higher than this but let's say that's a dollar and then but the the revenue that's generated from the from the energy output is a dollar 50 mm -hmm. we'd get the extra 50 cents through the supplemental payment so that's that's a win for albemarle because now we don't have to pick and gamble we have no real risk we're and going you're allowed to, get, to do that Yep, you're state, allowed to do state that. State gives that ability mm -hmm. to do that. Right. And there's certain things that the money has to go to. It looks like there's categories, but they're pretty broad. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So, you know, the machinery and tools tax comes in, that just goes into your general fund, but the supplemental payments, it seems like have to, have to go to certain categories. Uh, and I might not even have that right. That's uh, yeah. it was still a little unclear to me, but it just means that a big project like that for us is going to, uh, that Albemarle kind of wins in that situation. So I was pleased that we, we were able to get that siting agreement that way. And I would just say, while we're talking about solar and that particular project down in Scottsville, um, I know I hear and we hear from the community that they're very concerned about solar projects like that uh, consuming prime agricultural land. I don't... It's there, an issue in it, Orange County right now. There is certainly, and I think I can say this, that there is an agreement on our board that we don't want solar to be eating up and taking our prime agricultural land. But that's I will say that, that, I was just going to say, that piece of property was a moonscape. <laughs> the one on Route 53? Right. It was not. Yeah, yeah. It, behind the I trees. I drive by it every day. It's behind the, the trees. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think almost all of us at the time we were uh, dealing with that proposal, were, we were out there in Jeeps or whatever, you know, before, you know, um, you were four wheeling. We were four wheeling. I would love to and see you I on a four wheel. To, I have to tell you that at one point I was going almost, like and stuff I was like that. almost seasick because of the way that that oh, yeah. it's washed out and the yeah. ruts and the just in. I think you were going yeehaw. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what you were. I'm doing. just saying though that piece of property was a moonscape. Yeah. And, so, uh, <laughs> but what, what, what I, we learned also yesterday from uh, Ernie from Nelson County. Yeah. Um, they're having a project they're working on. If they were to actually take all the megawatts that that's produced, it could actually energize or provide electricity to the whole county of oh, Nelson County. Oh, so that's kind of an interesting yeah. thing. I, I, yeah, you continue yeah. with what he said. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You finish. No, you, go ahead. You were, you were <laughs> but it, down there. But, but, it, but it's getting a bit of a, a pushback so on So they're it. on CVAC. Yeah, CVAC? Yeah. C, yeah. C, what's the Central cooperative? Central Electric yeah. Co-op. CVAC. Yeah. 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 But this this line that this hit their solar all attached to is Appalachia Appalachia Power, so which doesn't serve all of Nelson County. Okay. So they could get the revenue from the solar, but the energy is going else outside oh, of outside county. that yeah, county. It only oh. serves. Well, that was a part I was kind of going to skip over. So, <laughs> but I mean that's a dynamic <laughs> yeah. that they're yeah. dealing with. Yeah. It's like well the yeah. you know he would he, 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 in the, like in the case of uh, the Woodridge it was right on a it power was, line. Yeah, so and it was, it like was for us. That was. Yeah. Um, but the yeah. uh, but in Nelson that's a when I was listening to him talk about that and again Supervisor Barlow and Louisa with what they're dealing with. Um, I mean it, it's interesting conversations. What I find fascinating in the environmental lobby, which is a large lobby right. in Albemarle County, right. watching because you know I think immediately. Whether it's fair or not, people think solar, they think environmentally friendly, yeah. that they're just going to have yeah. automatic support yeah. from the environmental yeah. lobby, which in many cases you do. But in these large pieces of land, then there's the debate within that lobby about what to, right. about is, yeah, the, it's is the gains of the solar right. well, yeah. outweigh or, or is it do more harm based on the land and the disturbance of the land? So it's an interesting debate that happens within that one particular lobby. Yeah. Um, so the Route 53 out. property was totally timbered over. Oh, it, it was a it landscape. Was, it was it's just awful. But for the, mo for the most part, it's, um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's like a development project. You're clearing that thing all, mm -hmm. all, all the way out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ray Cadell watching the program. Oh. He says these two supervisors are the two most easy to reach and the most responsive supervisors oh, over the years. Well, that was That's kind of nice. Funny. And he's giving you guys some props here. We have multiple media outlets watching you guys on the feed. Keith, you finish your thought, and so, questions are so coming Diane, So, Diane, oh, yeah. everybody wants to absolutely hear every word that you're saying. You just need to be a little closer. To the oh, microphone. I'm sorry. Here we go. Did I do that Excuse well? Excuse me. I have a tendency United to do that. On, you you <laughs> did that extremely well. Thank you. I'll do this and that's see if that's better. Friend of the program, John that's Blair, watching the show. If I didn't do show. it right, I'd get beat by my yeah. wife and my mother. Yeah. yeah. I will say, though, while we're talking about solar, I just attended um, the school division's sustainability. Um, I'm a liaison for the school division on their sustainability work. And I have, and of course, the school division has a lot of buildings, right, unlike the county. And I have really been impressed as to how the 
this county school system is putting solar on their buildings to include the new boys and girls club yeah. over at Lambs Lane campus is has solar all over their roof. I just think just speaking to well, solar. I, I don't <laughs> I don't want to sound like I'm bragging because it's going to come out this way, but this little place that my wife and I go a couple times a year down in the Caribbean is completely run by solar. Yes. Yeah. The whole property. Yeah. And I think that's what they're looking at for the Boys and Girls Club, for an example, right? But the school division is doing a great job with their solar on their roofs. Yeah. Um, so we have comments coming in, and I'll just put these out in the uh, conversational universe for our panel. How does the Board of Supervisors manage population increases for Albemarle County? It's been put in the feed here from Jennifer in the Whitehall District. And this one is based on a comment that Keith just made, and it's from Stephen, who's watching Pickleball. Did someone say pickleball? Pickleball. Yeah, let's put it in the feed. <laughs> we, we the sport is booming. Right? Louisa County, the, the Louisa County uh, Board of Supervisors, right, was Tommy Barlow. That's all he talked about, because what, what we do, at, at, if you have ever attended one of, one of our uh, Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission meetings, there's always this round table, right? And, and the chairperson, my fine friend, Ned, he had to write to me, goes around and asks everybody. And that's what all he was talking about, the pickleball. Rooms packed <laughs> with pickleball. I believe some your, in favor and some against. Right? I believe your district, Greencroft, has got some fantastic pickleball courts. Yeah, I actually, play there. Yeah, I belong to Greencroft. Yeah. I do not play pickleball at okay. Greencroft, but they have a great court. The courts they, are the fantastic. Courts are great. Yeah. Yeah, Darden Give them a little Tau. plug here Darden in Darden Tau. Tau. does yeah. too. Town, yeah. I will say though, as a, so as the around? as the <laughs> it's very messy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Very as the well nurse played. in the room, as the medical person uh -huh. in the room, well, I will played. tell you that so, folks that start playing pickleball need to be careful because it is injury. People think, oh, there are no injuries. Eh. You know, you, you can get injuries and with usually pickleball. Usually, they're kind of my age and up, right? Exactly. So I'm just putting that little warning out there. <laughs> in my, as a, in a, at the district level, the only thing that I've heard about in Rio about pickleball are HOAs where people are getting fed up with the pickleball because the sound because it the is noise. noisy. Yeah. and that so was they a, have tennis courts, and mm -hmm. people are going to play the pickleball on the tennis courts, which is which is fine, but if it's right by a house, the people in that house are not thrilled with the pickleball. Right. Right. But I, th that's an HOA level, yes. and that doesn't yes. rise to, yeah. they reach out, but it's like, all right, you got to yeah. go to your HOA well, board and figure that out. And we had some problems with some of the neighbors uh, behind Greencroft, Greencroft concerned yeah. about the noise. And I think that was somehow or another addressed, but I'm, I, I'm not going to get into that. But there, it, there is <laughs> so noise this that's affiliated. I got nothing else, but I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> But to get back to your original question, so you're talking about growth in Elmore County. One of the ways that we limit growth in Albemarle County is our 5% of, of oh, development area. Are we going to go down that road? And 95% <laughs> rural area. Yeah. But I'm answering your question. Yeah. That designation of 5% being the development area definitely puts limitations sure. on our growth. And I'm not saying that you should, we should expand the development area, or I'm not getting into that debate right now today. Well, you've said previously but, on this set that until the 5% is at full occupancy, why would we expand exactly. the 5%? That's exactly right, yeah. and I still agree with that. Yeah. Uh, having said that, I think people fail to realize that that 5% and 95 does limit growth, and it has protected mm -hmm. Almar County from what many people think about as sprawl. Mm -hmm. Well, my cohort to the, to the right, or my cohort in crime probably to my right, mentioned something yesterday that actually Elmore County is really a rural county because of the five. Of the 95 the and the five. 95, mm -hmm. yeah. 95, yeah. five. Yeah. Because back on transportation, we had a great conversation yesterday about, and I'll let you kick it off, Ned, about the rural tr transportation um, that's coming our way and the um, authority. Yeah, I'll tee it up because Diantha is the expert on, on the transit, but they were, we were talking about the Regional Transit Authority. So the TJPDC oh, yeah. yeah. advanced, we had to approve saying yes, go ahead with the direction and give staff the direction on continuing the work with that. But the, the rural counties that were at the table, so the, the start of that transit authority is gonna be Charlottesville and Albemarle. But I brought up the point that don't forget that first off, our urban ring doesn't have a fully functional transit yeah. system. So we don't have mm -mm. fixed routes that work well. Mm -mm. Micro transit, or micro cat will hopefully be the solution to that. But the rest of the county 
is rural, so the fact that this transit authority allows us to bring some new funds in can maybe help us figure out and solve some of the, well, th there's the rural transit needs analysis, figure out what the problems are, where the service needs are, and if Albemarle can start figuring that out for us, that could then become a benefit to the other rural counties of how they how they fix. What it was, it's low. I've got to like. Oh, I can I can move the microphone. That's perfect. Um, but it that's works. what that was my point last night. Yes. Speaking to like Green, Fluvanna, Louisa, saying, "All right, if Albemarle starts figuring out what we can do in rural transit, and the transit authority helps us get at that." then you'll have the benefit of seeing that mm -hmm. and then can decide mm -hmm. for your own jurisdiction, mm -hmm. this is something that right. could work for us. And I really believe that once we get the uh, Regional Transit Authority established and we work out the, because I'm sure there will be challenges along the way, and, um, but once we get that uh, authority established and, the other, and we figure it out for us, right, then the other counties will come knocking at the door. Mm -hmm. But I understand that, I understand their reticence right now. The, the regional transit partnership, which is only an advisory group, uh, and you know, I've helped with the creation of that partnership because of our lack of good transit in the urban areas. We have now, the partnership agreed this last month meeting, we have challenged or asked the city and the county staffs to work together to come back to us in about 90 to 120 days with not a full-blown plan, but with the beginning, the suggestions of how to get that authority off the ground, to get it started, because we can't just keep talking about it we, we, and we the localities cannot continue to fund transit if we want a robust transit system out of our operational funds mm -hmm. we need funding and that means we need an authority mm -hmm. <laughs> what I found most interesting about that discussion and I'm, I'm, I'll turn it over to Jerry to some other questions um, is um, it requires Charlottesville and Albemarle to do it even though Fulvana County would be part of that well, we can join in, but really it's the city of Charlotte. Well, that's because there are, and I, didn't mean, I didn't, didn't mean to interrupt you, Did but, you interrupt the, me but where we had the agreement that the legislature gave us, yeah, our statutory said that it has to be begun, started, the authority by Charlottesville and Albemarle County. Mm -hmm. So Jerry, that's the first step. We'll yep. see if Jerry has any questions. I do. I, and I'm probably not going to let the 5% go away. Well, <laughs> ne ne neither is Neil Williamson. <laughs> Neil well, before you make another comment, because the question yeah. was about how do we manage growth, and yeah, I think population that increase. Right. Pop yeah. So part of that, and in, in, in on top of what Diantha has said, you know, the micro cats a good example of this. I think when people say how do you manage the growth, they're really talking about the impacts that the the continued growth give. When when we have issues on our roadways, we have road projects that need to be done to help the people move around. But MicroCAT, the calls for service in mid-December were 1,000. By the last report in mid-February, it was 8,000. So two months later, it grew by 7,000 calls for service in a small area. Right. So and I'm not... MicroCAT. MicroCAT is the pilot that we're running, MicroTransit, where it's basically curb-to-curb -curb service, like an Uber, that is that you get on your app, you call up MicroCAT, they'll come pick you up, and they'll take you... Uh, where you want to go, whether it's a fixed route bus if you want to get on there and go downtown, or if you just want to move around within the area. So like for folks in, my, in the Woodbrook area, to go across, I always use this example, just to go to Kroger, they have to get in their car and drive across 29 because there's no safe way to walk. But now they can just jump in the microcat and go over to the Kroger, the library, and, and move around within that immediate area without necessarily getting into their car. I don't think that solves our congestion issues, but it certainly helps. It's a start. So as roadway projects come online, which we're vigorously going after, although we are behind um, in getting uh, a lot of the uh, road improvements done, but getting a fully functional transit system, especially in that urban ring, is going to help with the road impacts, I believe. And that's another way that you manage growth right. that comes into your right. into your county. And the only thing I would add to that is that the microcat pilot that we're running right now, which I think we had in early February, our highest call data per day at 140 
calls in one day in February. And we haven't really even started advertising this yet, right? right? And it is a very limited area. Having said that, <clears throat> what that pilot is going to show us is where the demand is. I can sure. tell you that right now because I'm looking at it. And uh, that's the beauty of it, to be so honest with you. So, new construction, single family <laughs> attached. I just, while you guys were chatting, I wanted to see what's in the pending bucket right now. So, these are homes that are under contract that have not been built yet that are going to close. There's a hundred of them. This all happened within the last 30 to 60 days. So, there's a hundred houses for sale. 30 of them are up by the airport. 30 of them are up over in Crozet. There's only three that I would consider the urban ring. It's actually probably a little bit out of it. Everything else is already outside of this urban ring. This is the new construction. We talked about a little bit off air, and we'll talk about it later, where the, where the sales are going, right? Where the people are buying. Well, that's where they're buying. Mm -hmm. So it's out, totally outside of the urban ring. And I'll, I'll let Neil jump in on his question. Well, Neil pushes back respectfully, of course, the president of the Free Enterprise Forum on the 5%. And he says it's not 5%. It's actually less than 5%. Yeah. And he highlights, well, I will highlight, I, I know Neil well enough to <laughs> ad lib for him, the topography of the 5% is not conducive to yeah. development. Um, yeah. So I'll throw that topic for conversation. <laughs> I know Neil He's well enough that he'd probably say, Office conversion as a follow-up, because yeah. I know Mr. Williamson loves that topic. Ooh, yeah, he it. does. It's he's good. not wrong. No, I mean, no. he's not yeah, wrong. No, and he, I'm surprised he's yeah. not in there saying, yeah. and the board has not, the board collective over the years has not approved developments at their full density capacity, which then also limits your 5% because you're not getting to the expected you're numbers. And that's one of the problems we have is that we have only been supporting about 58% of the needed density in the pro 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 proposals that have been coming to us. So well, we agree with Neil. I mean, yeah. <laughs> which Neil also to, to support what you guys, you're, you guys are voting on, your constituents and voters have encouraged you to vote that way. Um, there does not seem to be an overwhelming appetite, including yours truly, for maximizing density. Well, even at 58 percent, we're, right. we've, we're, you we're got catching resistance. hell for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, it's, right. but it, again, it goes to the impacts, right? In the areas where the infrastructure is supportive, so uh, when Willow Glen came back for its final approval, um, the North Fork, when we did the North Fork redevelopment, I received one email about that development asking about right. and concerned about that's where they want traffic imp impacts but that's up to 1400 potential units yep. out mm -hmm. there right. mm -hmm. and nobody really came out because it's in a place where there's going to be a, a new elementary school that's going to come online soon the road improvements are there i just found out actually they confirmed for me yesterday that the that last leg of the Burkmard Airport Road oh, yeah. looks like the 100% of the funds are there oh, great. to get that that's done. Good. That's good. So that's a big deal. So when you've got things in place, you get a different level of um, a different level of impact. Now that being said, we had a development of 122 units in Crozet, and there are infrastructure concerns. I'm not going to sit here and act like there weren't, um, but that was that was a that was that was opposed by the community. And that had what I thought was a really wonderful, that development, which we passed, mm -hmm. had a really great mix of, of, housing, of types. housing types yeah, yeah, and some affordable included in it and mm -hmm. to include some It'll habitat, some habitat homes. Yeah. So that was in my, just what we need <laughs> to be building. As the recovering developer and builder on, on set, you know, the market is telling you where they're going and, and it's, and it's, Forest Lakes, it's the airport area, 29 North, and Crozet. I can also tell you from a commercial side of it, ever since you've, you guys passed the UVA rezoning, my phone has been ringing off the hook for yeah. commercial folks and saying yeah. hotels, stores, facilities, yeah. retail, because they see that's where the growth, right. which is what you guys were talking about. That's kind of where you wanted it to be anyway, right? Well, and to, be, and to speak... For UVA a little bit, they made it clear that that residential that would exist there, they're not looking to recreate what already exists at Hollymead Town Center with Target yeah. and the you know the retail spots. Yeah. What they want in that Burkmar Road segment, once that's done, that activates. They'll be a roundabout there um, at uh, Lewis and Clark Drive yeah. and Airport Road. 
so that people that are living there in that development can easily access Target without ever having to get right. on the 29. So once that road segment goes in, that'll really activate them. And to, and to really applaud UVA, I am so appreciative that UVA is working with us in my district over at the Piedmont Housing, the mm -hmm. faculty, Piedmont mm -hmm. Faculty Housing, mm -hmm. which it, and that is going to be a wonderful project, I believe, at the end of the day, for UVA nurses, <laughs> employees, if you think about sort of that missing middle mm -hmm. piece of uh, housing that we really need. So, You know, and I want Neil to know that I was quoting him last night at the TJPDC, he and he wasn't watching online. Uh, <laughs> seats available. <Yeah>. Seats were <laughs> available online. Seats were available. <laughs> so I, I think I'll just kind of say it out there publicly. I think you're going to have to address the 5% a lot sooner than, sooner than you. I think you guys are prepared to How do so? it. I think the market is just going to push it push it that way and uh, to Neil's point um, you know I, I take a little bit of um, I disagree with some of the staff on your album 44 right mm -hmm. um, there is not that much developable space left in the 5% it's either in commercial already it's undevelopable it's just not able to build properties folks are not going to sell it and it's part of why you're seeing these two different points in your county getting where it's where it's going but to look at 99 homes that went on the contract since the first of the year that are that are closing that are in the and 60 percent of the 99 70 70 excuse me of the 99 are in those two areas that's where the market's telling you it, it's going i just going. don't think you have the voter or taxpayer appetite yeah. to expand the five yes i agree 100 percent. not yet 100 yeah. okay. you know and you know, I, I always say to 100%. people, we can't really build new schools until the kids are falling out of the windows of the new school. Right. Hundred percent. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, from a practical perspective, yeah. It, yeah. it's going to have to happen. Is yeah. the political will there, or, or the, you know, the political folks living capital, yeah. is willing is willing to go there? But I, but I want to give you guys a bit of a, a of a shout out here. Um, I'd love to talk about it since it's a real estate show. I mean, you finally got your um, developer incentives done, so uh, we should talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to do a plug for my ROI thing. I think the biggest thing that I would like to make sure people know, hoping that, because I believe a lot of developers do do tune in here. Um, uh, you have four that I see watching <laughs> you right now. Because the incentive, it landed at 15% um, of the total property tax would be the incentive back, and that's getting to uh, on, on uh, rental developments where 20% of the units are uh, affordable, affordable and it moves the AMI from 80% to 60. That 15% of the total tax incentive would be for the 30 year period is designed to try to fill the gap lost in rental income moving from 15% at 80 to 20 at, at uh, 60%. It's not a, and I was emphasizing this point several times the day we passed it, it's not set in stone at 15%. Mm -hmm. it, it can have some fluidity to it or some mm -hmm. flexibility to Based it. Based on a project. And yeah. there can be other yes. incentives. Mm -hmm. The big one we heard in our work session in December was the tax incentive. So that's why that is the main one out there. But if you bring a project in, I like to use Willow Glen for this. Willow Glen came back to us and got rid of a road connection that would have been very costly, um, that would have cut through the little small part of their area. And getting rid of that road piece freed up money for them to right. be able to do more affordable units there and get their development mm -hmm. finally uh, mm -hmm. moving forward. Right. So if there are other things <coughs> that can be done, uh, parking requirements, uh, whatever, whatever you have, in tandem with the tax incentive, then that could help bring these projects on. But here's the main thing I want developers to know. It takes coming in and talking to the county to say, let's discuss my project and how an incentive program could help us get to the numbers, because what we ultimately want are the units, and we know that we have to help developers get there. Mm -hmm. And it, in the incentive program, the way it's set up, once it's applied for, would be approved, and developers would know what it would be and that they would have it before they ever went to get a rezoning. Doesn't guarantee a rezoning. Right? They're two separate animals. Mm -hmm. But they could walk into a rezoning going, all right, if I get this rezoning from the board, I have this incentive package and this performance agreement that's going to be able to move forward. And the board's going to have to do some work to make sure we expedite that process. 
um, as as will staff, and everybody was in agreement that that should happen. I was going to say we're all we've all recognized that. Sorry, yeah. I'll take no, up here, no, no, it's that, good. That, You're fine. Um, we're good. Big deal, but it's I would I would encourage developers who are you know if if I were the developers, I'd probably have some questions and be skeptical, and is this really going to work? There were concerns even leading up to the day that we passed it, but some details had changed. Reach out to um, both the. Uh, Dr. Pethy in the housing stat area, but also our chief financial officer, Jacob, has said that yes, let's sit down with the finance folks in the room as well, and let's have conversations so we can answer all your questions so that you can see that there's flexibility, because at the end of the day, we want to we want to get um, not just more affordable units, but the units uh, d get deeper into the folks that uh, can't afford to get in there. And if you can have that conversation up front, because time is money. So let's do it first so that we're not working at cross purposes. 25% <laughs> of all new construction right now is regulatory expense. Uh -huh. And time is part exactly. of that. Time That's is part exactly of that. Right. And I'll put my developer hat on a little bit. Um, you know, and, and I know this because I was in the room and I was part of helping setting this up. And so any developers that and builders that might be listening, you guys are prepared to actually have that conversation. Because in the past, that's usually was difficult, uh -huh. right? So you guys have stepped up to the plate and say, let's sit down and, and talk. Yeah. I'm an ownership guy, you know, I believe in creating generational wealth. Um, so we talked a little about rental. What, where did it land on the ownership side? So what the developer incentive conversation, now that we've taken a vote on it, does is allow us to get to the rest of Housing Albemarle. There's a lot of good stuff in Housing Albemarle that's really been on hold And in I just a lot happened of ways. to bring it with me today. Look at that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and we need to get after this other thing. I mean, it, we're approaching the three-year anniversary, yeah. and the incentives took up, yeah. what, over two years of conversation, right. almost the whole three years. So having that out of the way, we can start getting at other piece. So the, um, I think the land trust idea, you have now heard, uh, I've said it a few times, some other supervisors are nodding their heads. The county executive has said it publicly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that... Um, in similar fashion that we've acquired land for economic development purposes, that maybe perhaps mm -hmm. that's what we have to start thinking about mm -hmm. and figuring out how we can mm -hmm. do for housing. Well, Not we know it works because as everybody knows, I'm the chair of the, of the Piedmont Community Land Trust, but you guys were kind enough to give us about $650,000 on it, and we produced 23 permanently affordable mm -hmm. new construction units through partnerships with multiple partnerships mm -hmm. from Stanley mm -hmm. Martins and mm -hmm. nonprofits and lenders and so forth and so on. So it can be done, mm -hmm. uh, but it does require everybody at the table. Supervisor McHale has always talked about if the current land that we own, and most of it is school property, but yeah. is there any land that we own now that could be used for this type of thing? And then that piece that I just talked about, adding adding land for that purpose, that expressed purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't know how else, other than the way that we've done it in the past, where we're giving money to a project mm -hmm. like that, but that's onesies and twos, that, that's not on a scale that's gonna get the- Land matters. Piece. And I know there's some, some frustration over how slow we have moved. <laughs> Having said that, we really have tried to do it right, and we've brought, brought the policy along, and so this is our next, there's a lot in here, and this isn't going to happen overnight either. But we're really trying to be thoughtful and, and as we move our, our housing policies forward. I think it was super helpful to have those roundtables yes. we did in June or July of July. July and then in December. Will you guys continue that to explore the ownership side of it? Because I think engaging uh, the, the stakeholders like we did or like was done was very helpful to get us this far. I know they want to be at the table, so I hope you guys will continue these mm -hmm. roundtable discussions with the stakeholders. I think, I mean, I'd be open to that. I, I don't, we've not really discussed no. that as a, as a piece of it, but I would, I mean, seeing the benefit of it for this first incentive conversation, I mean, that would be, Yeah. I'm always a fan of bringing in, I mean, right, let's exactly. talk to the people right. that are doing and it. And I think our <laughs> staff has been supportive of yeah. these roundtables. They've not pushed back. They've not pushed back, no. that's right. Uh -huh. Uh, this is uh, well, they have, not to my knowledge. <laughs> a good topic for the panel. Um, Charlottesville City has recently upzoned much of its um, territory and jurisdiction. Would Albemarle County consider upzoning for the urban ring to create potentially more housing? I mean, my answer right now would be probably not, and I use that based on, now we have a different, 
I'm trying to remember who was on the board. When, when at one point we had an ha affordable housing overlay come to us, where basically if you, we would have had approved it, would have been a basic yes. just go ahead and up zone right. in the development area to full max density. And there was, um, including myself, there were six people there saying we're no, we're not ready yeah, to go there. Uh, there wasn't and, and a lot of interest in that. that. Yeah. Um, so we, that, that, that's my only, like, you know, it's easy for me to go, oh, well, we might discuss that, or oh, we might have that conversation, and then it never happens. So I try to look back on things that are similar, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if that didn't move forward, I don't know that we would just do a blanket upzoning like that. And, and we're certainly not discussing it now, right. even in light of what Charlottesville's recently done, right? So I mean, there are plenty that think we should, and I'm sure there's opinions that think absolutely not, but um, right that's just based on that previous conversation. I don't know that we will we'll be going. Yeah, through. and I'm not being critical of Charlottesville. We're different localities. We're different jurisdictions. But you are attached to the so. hip, though. <laughs> at least we at, are. At, at but least. I'm just saying that what they decide to do, I yeah. don't. Sure, of course. Yeah, I'm not criticizing. Yeah. The, the, the big struggle, I think, for you to do that there is really to get a down and dirty parcel by parcel inventory. And I think, frankly, if that was ever really done and spent to do that, you'll find out you don't have that much of the 5% left because the, the people in the field that do this for a living have, and there's you know the availability of space. To Neil's point, um, and I think some low-hanging fruit that could help in that is to tweak your commercial zoning a little bit, do like a, a ZTA zoning text amendment. I've seen this happen out in P Portland and Seattle and different parts of the country that you know some of these retail spaces or some of these other spaces that are not fully utilized, you can kind of allow that so it's not a rezoning application and say, okay, if you meet this certain criteria, and it's a very low hanging yeah. fruit, yeah. and you will not get much pushback because A, you already got your infrastructure there, mm -hmm. right? You've got mm -hmm. your roads, you've got your transportation, mm -hmm. you've got your water and your sewer, and people are used to seeing it, and some people, I mean, the, the Fashion Square Mall comes into mind, right? You know, people are kind of like, what do you, I get more questions about what, what is anybody going to do about the mall? Yay, Home the, Depot. Yeah, Home Depot. <laughs> yeah. But that's just one small portion know, just of a pretty large <laughs> yes. project. Yeah. And, it, and we've well, talked. We also have the county uh, utilizing part of the mall as well. Yeah, we are. Use a lot. The, yeah, but, the old, old. But there's a pennies, ton of property there. Section, it's yeah. still, I mean, you still have three property owners. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah that's very the difficult. That's, that's the struggle. Yeah. And most people, I'm glad you said that, Ned. Most people don't understand how complicated that yeah. is because there's multiple property owners right. and most people don't know they cut through the building. And, and it's it's a weird and they're not local property owners either. They are not. You know, I'm sorry. One but, is yeah. one of them one is, is local, but yeah. but many of them. Is that Richard and, Spencer? And it, uh, Richard Hewitt. Hewitt. Richard Hewitt. Excuse right. me. Yes. But at one point there were yeah. five property Richard, owners. Richard yeah. <laughs> Right. At least we've reduced it down a little bit. <laughs> um, Woody Fincham watching the program. He is uh, obviously an appraiser, and he is the owner of Fincham & Associates. He says the upzoning is not going to resolve more affordable housing. No. It's going to result in individual projects that will help strengthen portfolios. <laughs> and, and, it'll, yeah. and we've talked about this quite a him. bit. It, it is going to take many, many years, if not decades, before it really has a great impact on it. Uh, it's going in the right direction, much like much like your developer incentives, right? Much like your housing album model. Mm -hmm. These are steps mm -hmm. that are going into the mm -hmm. right direction. But uh, you know, from folks that I'm working with, we're looking at individual properties for anywhere between three to six and up, and the pool of availability properties in the city of Charlottesville is not that yeah. great. On it, you know, you, you've got to get the pieces of the puzzle to fit. Back to my five percent, yeah. you've got to get. Parcels have to have the pieces of the puzzle to fit. If not, they're just going to get skipped, skipped over to another opportunity. Um, the question, the real estate tax rate, any insight on what's going to happen there? This has come in from multiple homeowners in Almaro County, including a couple in the Jack Jewett District and one in the Rio District. Well, certainly um, Jeff Richards and our county executives proposed budget to us does not increase the property tax rate. We, as a board, have not had that discussion yet, and all I will say is we need to talk about what's on these six pages. And if some of those start sliding into the budget... Well, and I'm not saying one way or the other, yeah, sure, right? Sure. We haven't had that discussion yet. Sure. These just came out this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, Ned and some of us asked uh, 
um, the county executive to present what was not funded in this budget. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I'm just looking here and seeing fire and rescue, yeah. police department, yeah. sheriffs, yeah. Um, social services. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you know, those are... And sure, so that discussion has to happen. Is There's what a I would guy say. that's been on this set a couple of times that said, if you really want to know how your representative is going to vote, keep an eye on the budget season. And budget yeah. season is probably in its the sharply dressed uh, Supervisor Galloway, I believe. I mean, it started, it started in November for you guys, right? When did you start your oh, we talk budget? budget all year long. This budget started last year. Yeah, we, we talk budget. about budget all year long. So that is, that is kind of absorbs a ton of brain space and, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and time on it. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, um, you know, the last time the tax rate changed was 2019. Yeah. So um, one of the things um, that the staff is working on now that I had asked for was go back to the five-year plan. So if you look at 2019, five years later is now, mm -hmm. look at the five-year financials plan and, uh, back then and theorize what was the expected revenue in 2024, 2020? Where were we thinking we needed to be? And how did we hit it or not hit it? And then where do we compare to where we're at at this point in time? Because back then we had plan tax rate increases over those five years right. that we've not needed because the values have skyrocketed. Right. So we've got the revenue without the tax rate increase. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what that's going to fall. I don't know if we have more revenue now, less revenue than what we were right. thinking. Um, but I think that's a good exercise to say, all right, if you're really going to do the five-year plans and, and you're around, some of us have been around that <laughs> long, well, where are we at? Where, where are, we, are we hitting on the target revenue-wise of what we were expecting? And then how does that match up to our strategic plan and the things that the community is saying we need to do? Um, frankly, I'm, I'm not happy that there are no uh, police positions right. in, in, That's in this a concern. budget. Um, that has been yeah. one that each year that I try to figure out a way to get mm -hmm. even an additional. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, frank, and, and because of the roadways. I mean, speeding alone. <laughs> but it's about, a, it's about 100 and... Uh, for, to add a police officer, salary and benefits, if it's a brand new, you know, a, a brand new police officer, year one, it's about $110,000 for the position. And then it's about another 110, 120 to for outfit. The, for the equipment. So it's about a 220, yeah. 225,000 yeah. cost hit just to add one police right. officer. So, you know, what does a supervisor have to do? Well, I'd have to go find that 225000 that's either being spent on something else and saying I want it to go here instead, or um, you'd have to find the revenue. And uh, the only way to do that is to play around with the tax rates. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not only police officers, but we're talking fire and rescue for the fire department. I mean, folks are... You know, the volunteers in the fire department are practically gone these days. <laughs> and that was the, you know, decades ago, our fire department was based on volunteers for the most part. Boy, that has really changed. So um, Then the question is where they're going to live. But a, yes. follow, a part, second part of that question that, that I would ask is where did the values go? What was, we're talking about 2019? Right. Yeah. So 2019, the median sales price for a single-family detached home. It's going to be between a 20 and 30 percent increase. W way more. Well, I think way more than that. I didn't do the percentage math, but the median average in 19 was uh, 424. The end of 23, we're at 600. We are at the end of the second uh, month of 24. 24. Thank you. Uh -huh. 622. Mm -hmm. So that you uh, got to track. Oh, no, and, and Neil always reminds us of that. Well, the, yeah. the, the values went up. You've got the revenue. I know that. I, my mind is, it's like, all right, well, if we've got about the same amount of revenue without the tax rate increase, then we're, we're hitting our plan. Mm -hmm. We're doing what we think we were going to do. It just happened that the revenues came in through, you know, the formula was different because the, the values had increased so much. So the, um, the, the rate to pay attention to is the one that hits the car, folks' cars. Yeah, we so, dropped that down to uh, 342s jumping into my brain. It's, I don't remember. It's 342 but, but that was because 100. of this weird... Well, the pandemic hit. It was, it's March of 22, car values jumped up. The peak was 63% increase in the car values. And then um, I just read, I shared this with the board at our budget session. We've only, the car values have only declined about half of that amount since. 
So you're still looking at a depreciating asset has, is still higher than it was, uh, or half of that 63% peak. So you're still looking at what, a 30, 40% increase yeah. in your car values. And you know, when folks have a car that they've got paid off that maybe they paid, you know, back five, six years ago, maybe they bought a, a under $10,000 car that was six, seven, 8,000, they weren't used to looking at um, mm -mm. big tax bills on that. Well, we had, I had people coming in when, uh, at the dealership asking me to appraise their car because they were looking at the book values that were being used. Because they're, you know, they've, in my opinion, if I was trading that car in, I might have given them 500 bucks. <laughs> and I'm looking at their tax bill saying it's worth 6,000. Yeah. I'm like, well, that's not, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. So um, I've been pleased that we've kept that rate where it's been over the right. last couple of years. We didn't, I don't, they're still so high that I don't think people really realize that the rate was down because they were still probably paying more. But, but I was, really, was, uh, pleased. I was there. really pleased with the way we handled that yeah. in the budget. So yeah. we're, we're, we're kind of getting up towards the, the end of our time together, and I do want to get into real estate because at the end of the day, this is a real estate show. This is from Mr. Fincham, the appraiser, who I believe was, did he not work for the assessor's he, office in Amarcon? He did. Yeah. He, did. Mm -hmm. he says, I'm not trying to be overly negative but the way the assessor's office has been going after value increases in a lot of areas, they don't need to increase the rate. I've done at least half a dozen projects over the last month where we were having a hard time supporting a value as high as the assessed value that they're gonna post on July 1. And that is a very unusual uh, occurrence. I can tell you of 35 years of doing this, it's usually the opposite. It's usually tax assessors are usually below. Fair, significantly below. Significantly yeah. below market value. Now, legally, you guys are supposed to mm -hmm. appraise them at market value, but mm -hmm. market moves so much faster right. than what you guys. I mean, a prime example, if you don't mind putting a Judah slide 1A, gives me an opportunity to talk about my real estate wonderful slides, but just to take a look at it, um, single single family existing homes, detached homes, at the end of last year was 600,000. We're now at 622. That's at the end of the second month of this year, which is a 3.5% increase in the first, just in the first two months. Now, over the course of time, that might balance out yeah. a, a little bit yeah. throughout the year. You know, we can go. We can go and do that. But it's interesting. The single fam excuse me, the single family attached existing actually had a negative six percent dr drop. So mm -hmm. existing attached homes are selling less mm -hmm. now than they were at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Single family attached a little bit more, but the new construction stuff is up mm -hmm. through. The, he puts through it in perspective mm -hmm. with a home um, in Thank Glenmore um, with assessed value. Glenmore is what uh, that is. Supervisor Pruitt's district, Scottsville district. Right. My neighborhood, 2019, the home 600,000 assessed value. 2020, the home 590, 900 assessed value, so effectively zero. Then in 2021, this is the COVID effect. 2021, it jumps to 628, yeah. 200. Yeah. 2022, 701,000. 2023, 833, 300. And in 2024, 914, 200. So from 2019 to 2024, it spiked from 600,000 to 914,200 in assessed value. That's massive. Mm -hmm. The five-year delta of, of significant uh, appreciation. And, well, and I, th I think it's important because we always say, well, that this year the average increase was 4%. Four. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it district to district, I think, I have to go back and look at this, but I think <clears throat> the district, the magisterial district that was closest to that average was the Whitehall district. The Rio district and the Jewett district were much higher than 4% on average. I've got neighborhoods that are still 8, 13, and 15% increases this year. Um, and I say that because I don't want, when I say, oh, well, it went up 4%, we're getting back to something yeah. that existed prior. Right. Well, not in all the neighborhoods. There are still right. some people that are seeing a big increase in their tax bill because even though the average is 4%, right. there's still much higher numbers yeah. jumping up there. For and folks. there are pockets that have gone down. Yeah. I mean, I can name two neighborhoods right close to uh, that it went down in, in, in the Jewett district. In Jewett? Right, right. Micro so, markets matter, right? That's right. You know, micro markets matter. Mm -hmm. That's why when this the beginning of the year when stuff comes out, we end up getting phone calls and saying, mm -hmm. hey, give me market evaluation on what but you're But don't you think on. the landscape over the last few years with, the, with COVID and with 
everything this country went through, the landscape has just been very different. And well, it's been very... You're talking about the real estate? Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. chalk that just, up to an anomaly? Is that what you're alluding to? Well, I don't know at this point. Okay. But it certainly has been challenging. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and it's something that I think we haven't experienced many of us in our lifetime. Well, this is certainly an area that people want to live. And we were hearing this growing pain from the Louisa County Supervisor yesterday as well about growth coming into Louisa, which does not have an urban ring and the services. Right. And they're moving from places where they expect more. And he was, he was talking about that a little bit. Where they um, expect more amenity-wise? Services. Service-wise, service okay. But the services aren't going to be there because of how rural they are, and they're moving in from suburban or urban areas. Um, so the dynamic out there is changing somewhat. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this area is, I mean, what, your slides, I think, what was the average days to sail for? It was like five days or something, six days? Yeah, when we talked about yesterday or the one that we have I on. I saw oh, yeah, yeah, slide, sure. I thought, yeah, yeah, said, yeah, yeah. like, the average yeah. turnaround for... From the from the unicorn years on out, it, it, it definitely dropped down. I'd have to pick look so at the slide to go ahead and I do know this. Driving through Dunlora and Belvedere and Lachlan and places like that, those those for sale signs are if they're up for a day, that's yeah. a long time. Yeah. But but it's it's always the six things I've been talking about, right? Location, price, features, condition, timing and who's on the other side matters mm -hmm. on that. So if you hit all those things right, it moves that kind of great. You know, certain price points are moving a little fast, a little a little bit slower. Um I do want to give a shout out to Neil. Neil's working on something that he should hit his presses here in a little while, and he's working on looking at the needs assessment that NAR's putting out where new units need to be put and where things are under and over, and we'll find out here in a little while I'll do that, but from a quick snapshot, um, we're in this under permit, uh, permitted uh, area, but we're gonna let him, or limited, anyway. So. New construction matters. Uh, the prime example is the numbers that we have here in these 90 new construction townhomes because people, that's where they're pivoting to, to go ahead and buy. But, you know, back to your point about, I've been doing this for three and a half decades. I've never seen yeah. a market like this it's before. It's very, and it's, it's really, as I would say, wackadoodle. <laughs> well, there's just so, there's so many yeah. things. Yeah. Look, yeah. I've, I've lived through the time of great unpleasantness, so I know what unpleasant looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's so mm -hmm. many factors in here that we've never seen before, at least mm -hmm. in 35 years, 2% mm -hmm. interest, right. Right? right? The cost of construction being way, way off, off the charts mm -hmm. uh, to go ahead and, mm -hmm. and, and do that. So, you know, as to steal my good friend Robert Liberty's uh, thing, you know, this isn't a silver bullet to fix this. This is a silver buckshot. Yeah. Um, yeah. This question or topic for Matt Holbrook, and I will paraphrase, um, what happened with Ragged Mountain and mountain biking? <laughs> this very much they, recently in the news. So the, the, the legal question that was finally settled just this past week by both the city council and the supervisors, the city, the idea is if you own property in another jurisdiction's jurisdiction, right. <laughs> Whose rules apply? Whose sovereignty? Right. Who, it's a question of sovereignty. And the court right. settled it that it's yeah. Albemarle's. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Albemarle's rules will be um, settled, and that means no biking there. The offset for that for folks that are, well, where do we bike if we can't bike there, is that Biscuit Run coming online is going to provide plenty of capacity for biking. Mm -hmm. And there are other areas for biking as well. And there's no, there's other things that are restricted. It's not like we're just picking on on, on biking. But the the land around the reservoir is just treated differently than like Biscuit Run doesn't have a reservoir in it. Um, so anywhere where there's drinking water supply, what's allowed around that property, Albemarle believes is different than than other areas. And I would say if you think about the. The legal question, what Charlottesville was really trying to do, or they were doing, I don't know that they meant it this way, but it, they were annexing, um, they were really annexing by purchase. And we just can't have that. <laughs> well, I, I'm a cyclist. And well, what, do you mean, what, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is that, in other words, Albemarle County could go into the city and purchase property and then have Albemarle County control what goes on to that property in the city. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and I would say to Mike Signer, Mike, we could go over to Belmont and purchase property and put a go-kart 
range and run it 24-7. And he would say, well, you wouldn't do that. <laughs> Well, <laughs> wouldn't, couldn't, it's two different exactly. things. Exactly, that's exactly right. Yeah. So annexation by purchase is not what a locality can, uh, legally, we can just can't have that. And I want to be clear on, for, for bikers, because the folks that I've talked to about this, this wasn't about biking. No. This was about the piece that if, if you're going to own property, right. that that jurisdiction's ordinances stand. And, Stand, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. That's critical. And that's what I'm talking about. We can't have another jurisdiction purchasing property and then ignoring our ordinances. It happened to be that biking was the activity right. that, that, that accentuated the, the issue, but the underlying, uh, the underlying piece of that is very important, and we couldn't... That would have been terrible. If Anybody who developed a piece of property that's in two different jurisdictions with two different zoning ordinances and will will we'll completely grab that. But right. but Jerry's got Jerry's got a, a noon show and, and oh, well. eleven fifteen and we're, <laughs> we're a little we're a little Snook bit watching the program right down the hallway. We're, we're a little bit we're a little bit past our our time. Back on the cycling thing, as a road cyclist, anything you could do to help improve the road traffic conditions would 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 be great. And we are really trying yeah. to do pedestrian and cycling, bicycling safety. And I think, to be honest with you, VDOT is looking at that more yeah. much more seriously than they used to. One yeah. of the things in the urban yeah. ring that helps the, with the bike lanes that are currently there is the street sweeper we got running out there. Where right. We were up to 180 tons. Of right. Stuff pulled right. off the roads. Well, I've got the bike on the back of my truck, and I'm going to do a loop up around through through your your district and up through your district and come around. I'll let you know how the roads roads are, roads are doing a after that. It would be fun to have a conversation at some point about what some the new projects that VDOT is recommending uh, for some of our urban roads, like, like the Barracks Road corridor yeah. and the That's hydraulic corridor. It would be fun to do that because that really is on people in the urban ring are really talking about those projects and. Before we jump off, I just want to throw out there that the supervisors are going to do a little different animal this year when we do our budget town halls. So there's going to be a little different structure to it. It's going to be budget focused, but there's going to be other elements to it. Um, so those are being scheduled. Some may have already been scheduled, like mine's mm -hmm. tentative yet, so I'm not going to say the date until they, they lock in the space. But in the past, you just go out, get a budget presentation, do Q&A and that sort of thing. It's going to be a little bit, little bit more of an open house. There's going to be specific topics that are going to be addressed in addition to the budget. Um, to things that are on people's minds, transportation, yeah. et cetera. So yeah. just throwing that out there that this year uh, be paying attention to when those town halls come to your district. Um, and uh, please come out and give us not just feedback on the budget, but on some of the other elements that we're going to be and, doing. And many of them are being rolled into the Citizen Advisory Committee meetings that are already established. Yep. So, Diantha, I will let you have the honors of closing the show out. So how would you like to... Uh, Anything to add or say? Or? No, I just thank everybody. I thank you for inviting yeah, me. Anytime, Absolutely. you're always welcome. Thank folks for listening yeah. and for the questions. And, and you thought this was going to be, right? This is fun, isn't it? Well, I saw all your data <laughs> points, <laughs> and I said, "Whoa!" <laughs> well, <laughs> Ned expertise. knows we generally never get to them. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's hours and hours and hours of work, and we send them out. We generally never yeah. get them. Well, work. I said to you, I said I'm a retired nurse, not a not a real estate agent with all this data in my head. And <laughs> well, thank you for not talking about medical stuff. I Both of you guys it. are fantastic in this setting, and I'm I'm seeing nearly two dozen comments here. Thank you for this informative panel uh, and and this approachable setting. Um, Supervisor Ned Galloway, Supervisor Diantha McKeel, the star of our show. Keith Smith. Keith Smith. Is that my name? <laughs> Happy 600. Happy 600. 600. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, if yeah. I was smart enough, I would have gotten like hats and whistles and stuff like that. But. A new uh, partner for the program you want to highlight? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're working uh, with Tiger Solar, so a little bit more to, more to come. Yeah. Yep. And um, to, be, to be a sponsor, so, uh, you know, tie in together with some of our other sponsors yeah. and our trusted advisors on, on our Real Talk with Keith Smith partner tab. So pull it down and help support yeah. those folks because without them, we wouldn't be talking to you guys. So. Real yeah. Talk with Keith Smith .com. Yeah. Judah Wickhauer, thank you very much. And the I Love Seville show, folks, is up in one hour and four minutes. Thank you kindly for joining us on a Friday. Take care, everyone. Good Thanks, fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, it was Good a lot fun. of fun.